Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be welcoming you to our fifth round table with Michelle Monti, class of 89. We appreciate you taking your busy schedule to join us here today. This event is organized by Trinity Entrepreneur Network. As we all know, the Bantam Spirit has always been an entrepreneur one. And with our alumni body, we are proud to have successful and aspiring entrepreneurs of all ages and in every career field. <clears throat> And the Trinity Entrepreneur Network provides a dedicated space for Trinity entrepreneurs to connect with uh, each other and also with the current students. So for more information, please contact Melissa Bronzino Regan and please check the chat for Melissa's email address. She'll put it in the chat. And today's program is it's a part of the monthly series roundtable conversation with Trinity entrepreneurs on the topics of interest to the fellow entrepreneurs. And I have a few housekeeping notes before we start uh, our, uh, before we begin today's program. So uh, during Michelle's presentation, we recommend you set your view to speaker view and then switch to gallery view to Q&A session. And please make sure that you're muted throughout Michelle's presentation. Also, we will record this program and please feel free to use the chat to ask questions or her tasks throughout the presentation. Also, my name is Isabin Gavramariam. I am a sophomore majoring in biomedical engineering following this pre-med track. And Trinity, like I don't know if you guys know, but Trinity College, we just started this year uh, a student-led entrepreneurship club, and I'm the social media chair for the club. And it's my pleasure to present other members and my club here. Also, it's my pleasure to welcome them on today's call. And we would also like to, uh, we'd also like you to complete your prayer, your profile on the Bantam Career Network. It's like the Bantam Career Network is like LinkedIn, but it's only open to the members of Trinity community. And it's a great way for all students and alumni to connect with each other. So uh, the Trinity Entrepreneur Network um, created the BCN, which is the Bantam Career Network, specifically for alumni and students, especially who are interested in entrepreneurship. This, uh, this group provides a dedicated space to allow students and alumni to pose questions, seek advice, and to seek advice from each other. So we hope you complete your profile in the Bantam Career Network to join the group specifically created to provide space for alumni and students. And before we start, I'm gonna announce our upcoming events by organized by Trinity Entrepreneur Network. The next program, we have April 6 roundtable with Nick Nuenaski, class of 93 or franchising and new economy. And May 9th, we have a round table with Dr. Jennifer Hall, class of 89 on the entrepreneurial mindset. So if you have any ideas or for other topics or would like to recommend a speaker, even volunteer yourself, please reach out to Melissa. Her, uh, her email is in the chat. And finally, we hope you will share your feedback in our post event survey that is going to send out that that will be sent out tomorrow morning that you'll receive in your email. And today we are delighted to have Michelle Monti, class of 89 here with us today. So please uh, join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. And I saw the, the registration list. We have classes represented from all years. So very excited. I will um, start sharing my screen. And yeah, anyone who wants to show their face is totally welcome. And if you're still in pajamas, I totally understand that, no problem. So. Uh, can I can I get a wave that you can see the slides just to make sure good okay thanks so today's presentation is about using media effectively to promote your business but I also want to mention this can be to promote yourself so whether you're here to promote a product or a service or yourself this these hopefully you'll get some tips and um, for yourself out of this who am I uh, so a little bit about myself. I'm Michelle Monti. I'm uh, the founder of Michelle L. Monti Communications. It's my entrepreneurial side gig. Uh, in between full-time gigs, I've been going back to this business. And I am a Trinity alum, proudly, from the class of 89. I have attended every five-year reunion since graduation. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really involved. I'm a first-gen student as well. So call out to all the first-gens. Uh, I was involved on campus. I was a DJ for the radio station, mostly because it was in the basement of our dorm at Cook. So all I had to do was go down three flights in my pajamas to do the 6 a.m. jazz show. Um, I also was an editor for the newspaper and acted in plays there. Uh, and I did spend junior year abroad. 
Right now, I'm a communications consultant. I'm a writer and a project manager. Uh, I did a story a couple of years ago for Trinity called The Legacy That Can't Be Squashed, and they featured it on the homepage of the website. So if you want to check that out. And then currently, I'm working at um, Brown University for as a freelancer. I started my career at WGBH Television in Boston. I worked in PR firms and corporate communications houses. And then recently, my clients include Harvard Business School, Brown University, Good Measures, which is a healthcare company, and a few others. And I'm going to refer to these clients uh, without naming them in this presentation to give you examples of the work that I did and how you can apply some of the tips. I have always loved communications ever since I was a kid. I started uh, performing in plays and writing short stories and I realized recently that the common thread in all media is what I'm going to talk about today. So no matter what form of expression, uh, I really enjoyed them myself and then I made it into a career. So there are, as you know, so many ways to communicate a message and every day, every year, they create yet another tool or platform. So the list can be overwhelming, but you do not need to do all of these. In fact, the point of my presentation is you should not do all of these for yourself or your business unless you figure out what you're trying to say, who your audiences are, and is if the message is consistent with your mission and your brand. So this is a list of things that um, you know communicators often use to represent a message for a company. But again, the point of this presentation is you don't need to do all of these unless you can do them well, and we're going to go through why. So this, these are the possible ways to communicate, but they're not necessary. Uh, let's see. So this is a poll. Can someone tell me what is wrong with this picture? That's up. You can call someone if you want. You have to unmute too. <laughs> uh, Rebecca, I can go. <laughs> Did you want to call uh, Becky? Oh, cart leading the horse. <laughs> That's right. So the cart is before the horse, and you know maybe the maybe the horse can nudge this cart along or whatever. He might get a few inches or feet, but the guy might topple over. This isn't going to work. So there there are better ways to do this. So let's talk about how. Uh, so in creating media, my point is do not attach your horse until you have the right cart. So these are some steps in order to um, talk about before you do anything. First of all, you do need to be clear on your brand and your intent. So whether you're representing a nonprofit or a for-profit, a product, if you make widgets, if you make software, if you are a service provider, an insurance agent, whatever you are, you really have to be clear on the brand and your intent. It has to be almost like in your core. Like if you can just read everything about it and know everything about it so that you can speak about it well. Next, you need to figure out your ideal audiences, plural. For any brand, there is not just one audience. There's um, all different followers, users, they all have different needs and wants from you. So you need to think about each of the people in your audience, almost like imaginary characters that represent your different de demographics. So, you know, one audience member might be of a certain age from a certain part of the country or world. And then there's a different kind of user and follower. They consume media differently. As we know, there's generational gaps. Some people like to text, some people like to talk, some people like to type. So there's all different ways people use uh, media and you have to understand that when before you give them any of yours. Analyze the competition. Who are your com competitors and follow them on social and see their voice. I've done a lot of social media like Edsub, so I will be really um, anchoring this presentation on the social aspect of media. But a lot of people use that as well personally. There are different types of people using different platforms. You don't need to use them all. In my career, I've heard people say, oh, we need to get TikTok. That's the newest thing. No. Whenever a stakeholder comes to you with the output communications platform that they're suggesting, you need to pause and say, 
let's first figure out why we want that and what we're trying to say and then see if it's right for us. It's the hardest thing I think in communications because people see the trends and they want to get on board, but that's really important. So with the competitor piece, I would also watch your competitors in your industries and not in your industries. There are, you know, if there's brands you like as a, just a shopper, follow those brands. What do you see that they're doing that's creative? What ideas can you steal from them? Uh, we often steal ideas, tweak them to make them our own. And so there's nothing wrong with that. Then plan your presence. What channels do make sense for you to use? And then why? And then are you sure? So I can't emphasize enough this kind of stepping down thing. Um, people say we need a video. We don't, I don't know. Do you need a video or is it better information presented in another way? Like as a, as a graphic. Um, do we need a YouTube channel? Not if we're not going to be able to sustain it, if we can't create videos every month or period, you know, by the way, none of the answers I'm giving are going to be across all communications industries and jobs. Everything is subjective and you really have to, um, filter it to your own industry. So I would definitely recommend getting a pen and paper out because these tips really are going to require you to go do some research after this presentation and then strategize. What can you do yourself? What do you need to delegate? Um, people often think maybe my teenager can manage my social because they use it. Mm, maybe not. Um, communications professionals are really good at knowing best practices for each tool. So it may be tempting to just use someone because they've done it, but that's not really the best way. So we'll get into some ways you can do things yourself or maybe some roles you can hire out. Does anyone have any questions yet at this point? Happy to stop so this doesn't become just a monologue. All right, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to give you an example using this chart of a project I've done and how I used these five steps. So I, one of my clients was a disease management firm, which means um, a healthcare company that focused on a certain um, illness, which happened to be diabetes. So the first step was for me to get clear on their brand and their intent. So their goal was to educate patients with diabetes and empowering them to use food as medicine. So that's a quick phrase, but I really needed to read more about the industry, how other companies address diabetes and, and things like that so that I could really be clear on this particular brand and their mission. The next step was to figure out their audiences, again, plural. Um, one of their audience demographic was an older generation that had diabetes that lived in Kentucky, the state of Kentucky in the U.S., and they had an uh, average, the population had an eighth grade reading level. So no, that's really important to understand because then all of the materials I produced needed to be um, digestible to that population. So this is a tip that people in marketing will tell you about using personas. So you can actually imagine a person that's in this audience group. I literally gave her a name, a picture. You can just imagine what this person could be like. And then when you create the communications piece, you're literally talking to her. And that's a good way to test, is this, is this language you know, going to be digestible to them? Do they like this? Is this going to work? Then the next step was to ask about this, this company's competitors. Their competitors were Noom and Weight Watchers. So I would look into what Noom and Weight Watchers does and then make sure to differentiate this brand from those. Presence. This client happened to use Twitter and uh, Facebook they used Twitter for their healthcare clients. They used Facebook for their members and they used LinkedIn for their business partners. So really important, right? Each channel has different types of audiences and you all probably know Twitter is better for like the text, although there's more photos now. LinkedIn is definitely text and article heavy. Facebook is still a lot of photos. They change. There's no one size fits all to this thing, but knowing the platforms, Average use, type of use, type of content is really important, and that's what I did for this client. And then the last step was to strategize how to, what content we could create ourselves and what we needed to farm out. 
If it's a really savvy, sharp video that you need to represent the brand, you might need to hire a videographer. If it's sort of like testimonial, casual, maybe we can produce the video on our phones. So you need to strategize the content and then the platform after that. Here are three rules in these slides um, that I like to say. The first one is, it's about them, not you. Them is your audiences. So you may want to have TikTok because it's cool. You may want to have YouTube because you've seen other people do it, but it's not about you and what you want. It's about your audiences, what they want. And you have to really, every time you do something, remind yourself of that. So it's really hard. You can have something you think is super creative or looks really cool or has like a great graphic, but you have to check in, put a giant post-it above your computer and say, does this work for them? Not, not just because I want to do it. And as I mentioned before, if your, your team, your stakeholders, you know, they say, well, we want this thing. It's really the time to put the brakes on and say, well, can we have a conversation about that? If we can't do it well, or if it's not appropriate for our audiences, we're going to waste time and money. So let's check in and talk about if we're doing it for them, not ourselves. So remember, your audiences are kind of like you. They're like us when they shop or they're waiting for a service. They're thinking like we are, we, the shoppers are thinking like, what's in this for me? I don't care that you have this cool, savvy app. What do I get out of it? So remember to tell yourself to check in yourself on that. The second general rule is the data drives your strategy. So data in this case is either looking at for your social media, it's looking at the platform dashboard and seeing the traffic every month, which posts had the most hits for your website. It's Google analytics, which can be kind of a, a overwhelming tool, but Google analytics, Google has a lot of good training on that itself on that tool. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to offer you some resources too for things where you can learn more about each of these tools. And for videos, the data would be the watch time. How long did people watch the video before they dropped off? You know, um, as well as for all these things, shares and comments. But the data is what's going to drive your decision making. So you need to learn how to read that data. For an example, uh, for a different client, I did a campaign. We had 10 speakers in a video series and we took those videos and took transcripts from the video interviews and made them web articles. So this campaign had 10 speakers on video and then printed web articles, their text of that interview. And we noticed one speaker did really well on Twitter, much more than the others. So then we had to say, well, why? Why? If we did the same campaign. It was the same half hour interview. We posted it around the same time every Tuesday. What was different? And I found out that that one speaker had thousands of followers on Twitter compared to the other speakers, which had hundreds. So that's important to know. Oh, so there's sometimes there's factors that are obvious, like, oh, this video worked because it had this cool graphic or you think that's why. There's so many factors that you really have to question why you think something worked, but look for the data to back it up. Um, and another example, one of the speakers in this campaign did better on the web articles and their videos got no hits or very, very quick drop offs. Someone would start watching and after 20 seconds drop off. Why? Well, we analyzed it. So you really have to step back and think why. Sometimes the data won't give you the answer itself. Why was because her content was really tech heavy. And we figured out she spoke really quickly, as I tend to do here. She spoke really quickly. And we thought, you know, this content is so techy that people are, I think, having a better time on the web article version because they can slow down and read and look for the definitions on Google of her content, where the video was her talking and they couldn't exactly absorb the message. So these are just some examples of, wow, it's really interesting what you think might work and then what doesn't for a variety of reasons. It could be because it was a sunny day and everyone went outside that day and no one saw your tweet. I mean, it literally can be environmental. It could be like the headlines of the news are really distracting that day. So you have to take into account the outside factors driven by the data that you, you interpret from your activities. A tip, if you're gonna use social, 
I would really strongly suggest using a social media management platform. So these are tools that they, they take in your feeds from Facebook, Twitter, and they give you the data. They're amazing. There's one, they're and also not cheap. There's free or cheaper versions of each of these, but one I used is called Sprout Social. Sprout Social will analyze the people following your channel and tell you when they're an average online and when's the best time of day to post. Now we can just guess. I mean, honestly, I've worked for people where we just had time to put up that tweet. I don't have time to do it later. I'll do it now. What is that doing? That's going back and breaking rule number one. It's about me. It's when it's convenient for me, not when it might be most seen. So I would really suggest getting one of these tools. They tell you tips on when to post and they also give you really great data. And then rule number three is listen, test, and tweak. So listening means listening to the activity on your channels, listening to your users and what they're, what they're telling you either in subtext or, you know, visually by if they're liking and sharing, that's information. If they're not, that's information too. So it's, you know, all these projects are sort of subjective, right? Communications is a science combined with personal taste and subjective things like this color. Do, do the users like this color on this slide? I don't know. You know, that, that there's best practices for graphics and communications, but then there's like personal preferences as well. So you really want to take into account um, what you want to do and then listen to the data and test it. I could test this graphic with a different color and maybe alternate them and go through a couple of months posting them and then see which one got more hits. There's A-B testing. Many of you might have heard of that where the, pro the tool itself will do an A-B test for you. Um, so you, you can use the same exact everything about the graphic or, or post except for the headline or the, the wording or the graphic and it'll tell you this one did better. So you can kind of decipher, well, I think my green graphic worked better than the pink. Um, but again, thinking about the whole picture, what else could have influenced that activity? So uh, this is really, the nature of this slide is to tell you that it's about taking risks. You're all, if you're here, you might be an entrepreneur. That's what this, this networking table is about. Entrepreneurs are used to taking risks, right? You're used to sort of trial and error. So you really have to keep that hat on and be like, okay, I'm willing to try this. This is worth a shot. Let's just take a stab at this, but definitely making sure we've done all the research first, all the background steps. Do we know our mission? Do we know what voice we want to use? And then do we know our audiences? Like, let's make sure we've done all that. Now we can take risks and then tweak what works and what doesn't work for the next time we do it. You can take informal focus groups, polls. You can ask your customers. You could do polls and say, you know, why did you buy or why did what, what interested you on our campaign or our website? That's information to use too. Um, but overall, you need to use the data and then do use some of your own instincts as well. There's definitely a gut, gut aspect to this. I do feel sometimes like it's sort of like doing any creative project where I do a draft and then I kind of walk away from it for a day or two because when you come back, you do see it with fresh eyes. You do kind of come at it like a novice again and say, oh, I didn't notice that that was going to give me that impression. That word I chose has this nuance to it. It's not really the message I want to give. So it's kind of don't forget the iteration process of being a creator. Create it, walk away, and then come back. And the bottom line is one size does not fit all. One piece of your content may not fit on the other kinds of platforms. You have to massage it, trim it, change it. Um, an example is that I had this academic client give me two pages of real, like, very heady intellectual content. They wanted a social media post. Wow, there's a big jump there, right? So to take this heady content, in, you know, um, internalize the message of it. What does it mean? Am I getting the nuances of what this scholarly article is intending to say? Now I need to get it down to 280 characters in a tweet. Well, that's a big step. What's going to make me make sure that I don't lose the real core message, the most important part of that content. Um, so just knowing that it's going to take time to take any of your content. You, you can't really just take your brochure and make it into a web 
page. There's differences for those platforms. So you have to, again, take the content and customize it to the platform and to your users. Some of your content may be better uh, as a visual piece. It might be a better video or might be an infographic. So don't cut yourself off from other options. Just really understanding, thinking like a teacher in a way, like what would be the best way to get this message to my audiences? I'm gonna pause again, take a sip of water and ask if anyone has a question. All right, moving on. This is an overview of the steps to follow when you're creating content to promote either your business, your product or service, or yourself. First step is to research. I'm gonna say it so many times, that's what you have to do. Research your brand, your organization, your competitors, your audiences, your mission, and what you're trying to say and how others have said it. The second step is plan. What channels do you want to use? What makes sense for your business or service to use? What makes sense? And then read up on best practices for them. Here's a tip. Once I was working in a communications department and I asked the IT friend of mine, colleague, for a tip. And he said, Google it. And I was like, yeah, but you know the answer. Just Google it. Okay, got to do it myself because the mentality is teach them to fish, right? So I'm going to tell you this too. Everything is on Google. You can, or whatever, you know, search engine you use, the answers are there. You really do have to sit down with a cup of tea and spend time, accept the fact that you're going to have to spend time looking into things. So Google any question, literally best social media post for insurance companies, um, most interesting campaign, blah, 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 like whatever you're, you're looking for. Um, how do I, how am I, how can I be successful on Instagram? You know, um, what are the best pieces of content on LinkedIn? What's the best way to make a website? What's the cheapest way to make an effective website? Whatever you need to know, look into it. Um, because again, this presentation is giving you an overhead view. And unfortunately, the answer is you all have to roll up your sleeves and do this legwork yourself and do some research on these questions. So, so planning that um, and then delegating. What can you do yourself? Like being really honest, what can you manage successfully yourself? If you're, you know, if you can commit to the social media management, again, those tools are really helpful, those management tools. Um, and again, I have a slide to help you get some resources. Then you can do it. If you can write content, but do you need someone else to write it? Do you need someone to be more objective and to produce the media for you? Or do you not have the time or the expertise? There are websites that have freelancers. I think um, there's a bunch, again, Google that question. Where can I find a freelancer to manage my PR for my business? There's freelancers out there. They can do hourly or project-based um, estimates for you. Maybe it's time to delegate that. And, you know, try it for three months. I've had a client last summer that just, we did, we worked for two months together. I analyzed their social media activity on a spreadsheet. I looked at their competitors. I put all their competitors' handles into the spreadsheet, Facebook, Twitter, whatever their competitors' handles were. And then I taught them how to create effective content. After two months, they were done with me. And now they're self-sufficient. And, you know, none of it may be award-winning. It might not be, but it might be enough that they, what they need. So you can hire someone for a small period of time to manage something and teach you how to do it. But you have to be reasonable. If you're an entrepreneur and you're already swamped, can you do it? This client I'm thinking of, they actually had one of their team members, staff people, say, I can do that for us. I can take that role on. And she now manages the social. So you can just um, take a look at what you can handle or what you need to delegate. Step four, test, take a leap, post something, um, be brave, see, you know, just take that, if you've done all the legwork and you can be honest that you didn't just spend 15 minutes, but you really spent a few hours every day or week, and now you wanna publish something, take a leap, check for typos, check your gut, is it really ready for prime time? I want it to be ready, I wanna be done with this. Well, okay, let's look again though. Is the comma in the right place? the word spelled correctly literally because you can get so in the weeds that you might forget to proof 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 so show it to someone else and ask for their feedback but then test it just send it out step five is analyze look at the data and see what got traction review the analytics 
and see what you can use again in a different form, which is step six, revise. Maybe you try a different color, a different text heading, um, whatever it is. And then step six, seven is rinse and repeat. After that, you're off. Our horse, the horse is in front of the cart where it should be, and you can fly. Uh, that's the end of the formal part of the presentation. I do have these three slides that I will show you now, and we uh, will email them to you after this. These are roles you can outsource that I'm thinking. If you need anyone in these specific roles to help you, website managers, writers, social media managers, those roles are all commonly used now by um, entrepreneurs and small businesses. You can hire mm -hmm. out. Email newsletters are really great to follow. Um, these are some of that I read and um, I would suggest them and again I can we'll, we'll send these to you we have a question like oh, sorry great. to interrupt but we great. have a question I'm just going to read it out for you types of media what do you do if your clients uh, might not really use Facebook or other social media but is it free if you have just like started what would you recommend okay so you're mm -hmm. saying your clients don't really use Social. Facebook or social media. So what do you do if they don't use that? So you need to find another way to communicate with them. So mm -hmm. um, you can do what's funny on the top of this slide. You can create your own email newsletter and start to get them on your own email list. If you have a website, you can do other things to drive them to your website, like publish a blog. You can make a separate tab on your website called blog, and then you can create complementary content to your field. So whatever field you're in, Elizabeth, if it's, you know, whatever industry you're in, you start to think of articles that are like related. For example, I was writing ghost writing for a real estate firm. Mm -hmm. So they just wanted articles to drive traffic to their website. So we wrote about things to do in the state of Rhode Island, because that's where they were based or um, content about the current state of the real estate industry, like how there's more properties than buyers. Mm -hmm. um, so if you create content that's complementary to your service, that's another thing I would suggest. So it's a hard, yeah, it's sort of interesting, Liz, because it's older. I don't know if you want to come on with your microphone and tell me what field you're in or put that in the chat so maybe I can answer you more specifically. While she's doing that, I'm just going to hit the third slide, which was online courses. So if anyone wants to learn more about any of these things, there are all these free, I love these free courses. I take free courses all the time. The people running the courses will want to sell you something at the end. They'll sell their platform or service. I don't mind. I always get a golden nugget out of every course. I only take the free ones. <laughs> you'll get on their newsletter list. That's okay. You can unsubscribe if you need to, but you'll get a lot of good tips from those courses. So that's my, my free education tip for you. But like she already texted in the group chat, she's in the Medicare okay. insurance and retirement planning. Uh, okay, so I guess, Elizabeth, it's going to be like print, right, and web and um, mailers to people's homes, I think might be a thing. It sounds like old school, but I think that, you know, if, if they're not on social, um, it's a little, it's more challenging. So going back to research that question on Google, sorry to say, but it really is a thing. How to reach customers without using social you know, other ways of reaching customers in 2022. Add the year to your Google searches as well because some practices are outdated. And um, insurance, oh, I would also say, Elizabeth, just to Google effective communications campaigns for the insurance and retirement industry. So literally put the keywords into your search, the keywords of communications plans, your industry, and like non-social methods, if that helps. Um, all right, Elizabeth, and I'll think about it more too. <laughs> okay. So and if we'll... anyone has any question, you can just use the chat or even, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, um, this is awesome, Michelle. It was really helpful. Um, so I'm working on a project with a nonprofit and we're wanting to renovate this historic building. It's an old jail. And you know, it really helped me a lot when you're saying who your audience is, because people who are interested in history and historic things might be an older generation that aren't on social media, but we're trying to draw in a younger group to make 
I mean, it is interesting to some of the younger people. So we are gonna use the social media and such. But my question is different. My question is how do you figure out what you need to ask a freelancer to do for you? Because I mean, some of this stuff is intuitive enough for me and people like myself, we can you know, analyze certain things, but how do you figure out how to hire somebody? Like, because I, I think you've, you've mentioned, um, you know, they can do this, they can do this. There's a myriad of things they can do. So how do you narrow it down? How do you figure out how to hire them? <laughs> you know? Right. Right. So, um, and so you're looking on those freelance hiring sites and trying to figure out what they can do for you, or you're not even knowing what to, I don't even know about that. I mean, this is in this is in rural Maine. Um, there's probably someone out there in Maine who's really good at this. But like, how do we find that person who could do the freelance work for us? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, um, so there are those sites that are called like you know freelance project sites, and those in there, there's a database of freelancers that will show their project portfolios. Oh. So they'll say, you know, you could probably search on them for you know nonprofit freelance. PR or communications managers, yeah. and they will show you projects that they've done. So you can say, oh, and then you can start a dialogue with them and say, well, oh, you've done a, you've done a project for saving a historic building or something like, like that's what we're doing. Tell me more. And I would, you definitely want to create the dialogue before you hire them. Cause you might have a few people you could choose from and then just say, can you show me examples of what you've done and ask about the success too. So say, hey, uh, and this might be a way to actually steal ideas is really just say, what did you do that worked? Can you give me ideas that worked and show, you know, tell us how you saved the building, you know, how your campaign helped save the building, which is our mission. So I would um, kind of, it's like interviewing them, I guess, and really just saying, can you show me, tell me ideas, what other projects are similar to what we're doing, and then ask them to create a proposal. I've created proposals for clients. So propose to me what you would think we could do. They, they have to do a little legwork and it is on their dime, frankly. So they'll do a little proposal and say, well, I could give them five social media posts a week and a blog post every month and I'll, I'll charge you this, okay? And then you're gonna huh? say, okay, and, and the goal is what? The goal is we need to build up supporters and donors, right? Or whatever your yeah. audience, mm -hmm. you, you probably have five audiences, donors, supporters, you know, community members, education, educators, and just make sure their plan is hitting those different audiences. Okay. So you're saying there's freelance project sites. Is that one of the, the one of the slides you had? No, but I, uh, but I can, you can Google it or I can suggest some for you. Which <laughs> I is can Google it. <laughs> how to find a freelancer to manage my communications plan for my nonprofit. And one, one more, just to follow up with that. This is in, like I said, rural Maine. Does that does that person have to be there? Not anymore. Not anymore, Thanks, right? COVID. <laughs> What's that? COVID. Thanks, COVID. Zoom. Not anymore. Now yeah. you can hire people all over the country and world. And that's a great question, Becky, because for two things. One, is are they familiar with New England? That might be a good nuance for you to keep, right? New England right. heritage. Um, but there's time zone differences. So if you're going to need them to be responsive and they're in... Hawaii, maybe that's not going to work for you because they might not respond in the clock time that you want. So those are that's the two things I would add. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Upwork. Kathy, I was just suggesting Upwork is a good site uh, where freelancers. Upwork. Upwork. One word. It's in the chat. Oh, and cool. I, there's a couple others, but I'm not familiar with the names off the top of my head. Sure. We have another question in the chat. Yeah. What do you think about press releases? Are they outdated? Or if so, how would you recommend attempting to start getting more earned media? Yeah, thanks, Mary Kate. I know there's there's all kinds of things that people don't know if they're used anymore, like press releases. Um, but I think they're still useful. I'm not, I don't do a lot of PR. I did a little PR early in my career, but I don't do a lot. So I'm gonna always caveat this. There are people with more niche experiences in each area. So PR isn't mine right now. However, I've done press releases up in, even last year for my theater group because it may not be printed anymore, right? It may not be a thing you hand to the newsroom, but we made a PDF of a press release, same format, Mary Kate, you know, for immediate release, date, time, you know, date, month, whatever, header, what we're doing. And we emailed it to the local reporters to cover our play. And I also just was talking with a healthcare client who also did a press release on a health 
education campaign for getting uh, COVID supplies to their population. So yes, they're still being used. They're just not the traditional piece of paper, I think, that they used to be. I think they're more emailing them as PDFs. Still have your header, you know, your brand logo at the top and format it the same way as you did before. Um, and then to get more earned media. Yeah, another area um, I'm not as familiar with. I'm more in like publicity for events right now. So getting earned media, um, I don't have as many ideas, frankly. But again, I would research that question on your web browser which is how to get earned media and put in the industry or the thing you're trying to actually do. Earn media for my sneaker company, you know, like literally be specific. I'm do you have another to... question too? Uh, do you think clients use LinkedIn to find people, like clients that are not working professionally anymore? Yeah, I don't know either. I would literally copy that question into our browser. Um, I uh, I know that I get, okay, so I, my LinkedIn presence, I do put available for work. And so I think people are finding me because they're searching communications, higher ed, professional. So yes, I think that they are still using it to find people, Elizabeth. Um, I just don't know for your industry if they are. So I would, I would look into that. And you know what? Do it yourself. This is a really good practice. Act like the person you're questioning their actions, right? Go into Google and you do that search. Say, you know, search in LinkedIn for insurance professionals. Do it yourself. See what results you get. So you act like the audience and see their experience. And then you can even cater that by changing your own profile or business page on LinkedIn. Oh, well, this is how they're experiencing my search. Well, this is probably content I should move to the top or I should change my about paragraph to really speak to that search. I do have another question if no one has a question. Uh, what advice you wish you had given as, as a student at Trinity or like what piece of advice would you give to a college student who wants to become entrepreneurs, especially where like, you know, in the age of uh, where social media is the biggest part of our life? Oh yeah, it's a two, my answer is instinctively two parts. One is do everything. And two is set boundaries. <laughs> so I would say volunteer. It's kind of a sour pill to think that you're going to do this, some of this communications work mm -hmm. for free. And I do find that's hard to say, oh, I'm helping, I'm advising, I'm doing this for free. So that's why the boundaries piece comes in. Like um, I helped someone I know promote her uh, film. She's trying to raise money for a film. And I don't have a lot of time. We all are limited with time, right? But I did like the mission and I wanted to help. So I would say volunteer when you feel pulled, like, well, you know, I'm interested in this and I would love to help. And maybe it's portfolio material I can use later. Maybe it'll pay off because that person has a relationship that could help me in the future, like self, you know, what do you need for yourself? And then boundaries, literally, like I've, I, this is what I would say, because as a student, I volunteered for everything. I think it's the freshman thing. Everyone volunteers for everything and then quits everything except for one thing. Same thing with communications, volunteer, but like know your actual limits. Don't overpromise because then you kind of disappoint people. So start only promising small bits and be real. Like, okay, I can do, I could do three social media posts for them and I'm not going to do any more and I'll do it on Saturday and that's it. Like really boundaries. I think that's, that's my, my advice. Thank you. Also, we have another question. Have you worked with digital advertising platforms? I have not. Um, I, I've only done a few paid ads for one of the colleges. So, but because I did need to do two ads, I did research and I found that Twitter had a really great educational site on doing paid ads on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really informational. So I used, there was like a whole entire website, Kathy, of like tips from, for, for advertising on Twitter. And then I used those tips for the other platforms. So I would Google or research Twitter paid campaigns, best practices. Mm -hmm. And LinkedIn also has a good one. They, they have really good educational materials about using their platforms effectively. Thank you. Is there any question or thoughts that you want to offer? Can I yep. say, a, say a thing or two? 
Um, I just want to echo some of the things that Michelle said, you know, that, that were so important. I'm an entrepreneur as well, so I'm in, in, the, in the good group here. Uh, I, have, I have an educational consulting practice and I work with uh, my background's theater uh, as well. And um, I worked at NYU in the drama department at Tisch as their director of admissions for about 12 years. And along the way, I became an educational consultant on the side. And so now I have, I've, I've left NYU and I'm doing this full time. Um, but I'm still a sole practitioner. I'm still just me doing everything to run this business. So there's the there's the consulting part, and then there's all the business stuff. And I built the website and and we have social media, but that's that's the point I wanted to mention because we were talking so much about it. You know, the, a distinction that I had to learn to make was to say, you know, I have the I have the ability to do this, like social media. I just don't have the capacity to do it. That's that when I had that moment, I'm like, yeah, because I was putting things off because I'm like, why do I have to give someone else? Why do I have to bring someone else to do social media? I can totally do LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. I can do that. I can make posts. I can put them into Hootsuite. That's on your list. Hootsuite and it'll time them all to go out. I could actually do that, but I mean, so far nothing's happening. It's not happening. So I did, and I'm screaming. I'm sorry. I'm screaming at the at the. Mic. I always <laughs> do that. That's the theater but, in you. <laughs> is the theater in me, right? But but I I so I did bring on somebody who was a former colleague at NYU. She was worked with very closely with me, and so she's we are sharing the load of social media. So what what we're doing is I'm doing little posts about theater, uh, theater schools, film schools, and. Um, summer high school programs in, in, in the arts. Uh, just little posts with some slides with information about them as a kind of to spur research for students to go and check these schools out. And so I do the research. I created, uh, just to give you the quick thing, I, I won't take up too much more time, but yeah. the, uh, a, a, a Google form for myself of these are the things that we need for the posts. I use the Google form. It creates a Google sheet with the answers. Once I'm on the website of each school and I fill it all in, Molly gets the information from the spreadsheet and puts it into as she builds the posts. So I do the research and gather the information, and then she takes the information, builds the posts for Instagram, and adapts it, as you mentioned, to Facebook and adapts it to LinkedIn so that they're because they're, they're a little bit different, as most of you know. So we share the load in that way. And then she does the follow up when people if people respond to our posts, a lot of the, the schools will say, hey, thanks for posting about us or whatever. So she does that follow up. So sharing the load while I'm paying her to do it as a, as a you know, I'm like, it, it, it's been worth it because now for almost two years, I've had this social media presence that I would not have had had I left it on my own. So I just wanted to throw that out uh, there as a little lesson. Uh, and I didn't even pay Chris to do that for this presentation. <laughs> that was so good, Chris. And the, some of the points I love that you said is um, just like, doing this form, like whatever system works for you, folks, like whatever works for you, a checklist, don't forget to put a link to da da da, don't forget our logo, don't forget our whatever, checklist, right? Whatever process you're using Google Forms, fine. You know, whatever process you can create to make it streamlined, right? That you're always gonna do that. I love that idea. And the other thing I was gonna ask is, what's the name of your site and what channels are you using, Chris? Oh, uh, my company is called Nothing But Drama. Um, I don't know if I even said it, I'm helping theater, film, and dramatic writing students navigate the college application and artistic review processes. That's what I do. Um, wow. So it's nothing but drama. The handles are, I, I think the Instagram, I know the Instagram and Facebook, are both nothing but drama dot LLC. Okay. Because I had to, that's the only way I could get someone else got nothing but drama before me. Yeah. So I had to add it. So, so that's, that's, and the website, same thing, nothing but drama.com. Congrats. Put those in the Enjoy. chat. Because oh, here's the thing, good. the cobbler's kids have no shoes. We always forget to market ourselves and do the same thing that I'm preaching for ourselves, right? It's so funny, but we do. So I want to follow you and, and see this thing that Chris just did is he told us all about it. And if we follow him, he'll get traffic and engagement and uh, more followers too. So I think this is, that was a great story. Thank you for that example. I'll send you the check tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there's, the, there's the handles. Yay. Um, yeah. And if anyone else, we have just a few minutes. I know Edsub's going to give me the, the five minute warning. But if anyone <laughs> has another story to share like that, please, please um, come on and do it or chat it. Because I think that's the best thing about these groups is you really learn from other people's experiences. 
which is why I take all those free webinars and courses because you really learn nuggets from things. Um, so thanks for putting that in the in the chat. Elizabeth wrote research. Research is the best thing to do. It really is. Like it's, I try to like make it fun, right? I'm gonna sit down with a cup of coffee and I'm gonna read about. Oh, new Instagram reels. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't, it's not my favorite thing, but I need to know it. I do. If for the audiences, I'm dealing with college students too. Um, so sit down and read and you'll be more empowered. And like Chris said, I love your point, Chris, of like capacity. I might not have capacity, but it is helpful to understand the jargon and the stuff that people are doing. TikTok, right? I got the silly thing on my phone because it's what people are doing. Get it just to understand it. And then you'll be able to answer the question, do we need this, right? And yes, we, I'm also, I was just going to show you my last slide. Um, One more you. question. Can oh, good. Me? Yes. I finally got on. Is this Elizabeth? I'm smart. Yes. Hey, you're smart. Yes, I we're just trying to unmute myself from my phone and then, yeah, oh, good Lord. And good job. On Zoom. I would think I would be good because I'm class of 2005 but no um my question is you said about google and i agree with you i actually was just on a webinar like this for my high school and he said the same thing of doing the research but you for the research like right now i've just started getting into the facebook and posting and everyone keeps saying about hashtags so a friend of mine went to college for it and so he knows it but it's the software side of it and so he was trying to explain hashtags to me i mm -hmm. kind of get it but do you have any idea they keep saying oh if you have a cool hashtag you want your hashtag to have as many clicks as possible i didn't really yeah, understand yeah, yeah. like I know do you exactly. hashtag your own company like do uh, i hashtag you know okay. raw senior services or you know right. women in i been doing right. stuff of women in finance. Okay. So a couple of things. Um, this is a whole thing in itself. So look even look for free courses on hashtags. Number one, okay. literally. Number two, I literally had the same debate with a client. She was like, I think hashtags are dead. This was last year. I, oh, hashtags are dead. Well, let's see. <laughs> and you look at other people's activity and they're using hashtags. They're not hashtagging your comp their company names because that's that's their company name is seen on the platform they're publishing on twitter is going to say at elizabethross.com right so that we already see that but they're hashtagging the theme like what is everyone like the other day monday was or tuesday was international women's day so people were hashtagging international women's day so a theme that relates to the content in the post but the other thing i really want to tell you there's these things called hashtag research tools you put in some keywords like I want to post about International Women's Day. You type that in this body of this hashtag research tool and it tells you hashtags that people use with those keywords. Rest pie oh. recipes, hashtags, love pie, whatever it is. Like literally you'll, so put in the theme I want to write about or my service is this or, you know, plan your future, right, for you. Put it and then you'll see oh people are using this hashtag called future planning hashtag future planning hashtag la 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 and they tell you the tr the amount of hits for a hashtag there's a bunch of tools they're free so i would i would do some research on that okay and then because those are being used the most that's right they'll tell you this hashtag it will make your face your facebook page higher up or whatever ah uh, right so then a facebook user might put in the term you know, planning my future, and they'll get all the content with that hashtag. I honestly okay. think, think of us as users though. I don't really do that. Do you all? Like, I don't really put a hashtag in a search bar for Twitter. I, Unless it's, on uh, Twitter will show you on the right trending hashtags, like trending Ukraine. It'll show you, and then you, mostly you click on the, oh, what's everyone saying about Ukraine? And they click on the hashtag. I don't know, Elizabeth. I, it, the jury's out. My answer is to tell you, there's totally different opinions on this. If it's not your thing, it's what I said about TikTok. You know what? Not my thing. I don't think my industry is using it. Research that. And then don't worry about it. There's too many channels where you can, like Chris said, do it well. I wouldn't get caught up in it's the latest craze. Should I do it? But research okay. it first and answer for yourself. Okay? 
Okay, Look perfect. I just, everyone, as you said, everyone's like, ooh, do hashtag. Yeah. Get you yeah. seen more. And I'm like, I don't know how to hashtag unless I hashtag my own company. <laughs> yeah, tell them you got to do your TikTok video first. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. That I would have to get one of my nieces or nephews to do Thank for me. You. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. It has been very helpful. Oh, I'm so glad. So we're at the one o'clock hour, so I want to, on Eastern time. So this is my website. This is my LinkedIn. I really love Trinity. I had such a great experience there. So I'm really happy to do this. And hi to all the people watching this on record. Um, and thank you for all the people who did attend and for talking. Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle, for your presentation time and all. We really appreciate you for taking your time here, for taking your time and be here with us today. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and be active in the Q&A session. Please look for our post and event survey that's going to come out tomorrow in your email. And also please join the Trinity uh, Entrepreneurial Network, complete your profile in the Bantam Career Network and follow up with Melissa if you have any question. And thank you so much. Thank you, Etza. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, my fellow Bantams. <laughs>